you all here. Welcome. And thank you all for coming. My name is Judy Rich. I'm the president and CEO of Tucson Medical Center. And we're going to spend about 90 minutes together tonight. First, we're going to hear from some panelists. And then there will be opportunities for you to ask questions via some cards. And I'll tell you more about that. Tonight is the second in a new series of community forums that TMC is conducting on topics relative to health and well-being of our community. In April, we brought a national expert on the opioid epidemic, and tonight we will focus on health care reform. Specifically, we will discuss the legislative proposals put forth by the U.S. House and the Senate. You can see that there are no elected officials on the stage. <laughs> and with all respect, that was intentional. <laughs> we have received a lot of questions about what this means to providers, to patients, and to our community. And we believe that the best way to talk about this is to put politics aside and let experts inform us. Have a dialogue with us and tell us how we can be engaged in this process. From my perspective, we need to encourage our elected officials to set the AHCA and the BCRA aside, to vote them down and then move forward toward a bipartisan solution that will keep our communities strong. I would like to quickly recognize the public. I'd like to recognize just a few people in the audience before we get to our panelists. Um, I want to know if Dr. Amy Bider got here. Amy, if you're here, I'd like to welcome you. She's my colleague and CEO at St. Mary's Hospital. I would also like to recognize a member of our board of directors, John Young, who is someplace here. John, if you would stand up. There he is. And I also would like to recognize Dr. Bobby Robbins, who's our new president of the University of Arizona who uh, is here tonight in the front row, and he just happened to get an email about this and decided to come, so thank you. So glad you stand up. In the interest of time, I'm not going to introduce all the elected officials and their staff who are here tonight, but I would invite all of you now to stand up and be recognized. and thank you for participating in this important community discussion. While tonight is about looking forward, when I look at this crowd, it reminds me of why I am so proud to be a Chisone. As a community, we worked hard to understand the Affordable Care Act so that we could use it to benefit this community. And the people in the room who were part of that are former Congressman Ron Barber, made positive changes to the legislation. Dr. Matt Hines, who went to Washington to work with the implementation team, and to Sun Corridor and Laura Shaw. Laura, I don't know if you're here. There's only about 600 people here. Um, uh, to, to work with all of us here locally. And of course, Mayor Rothschild, who has been a tireless champion. and many others. So we've made progress. People in our community have health care coverage they never had access to before. And now, it seems those gains are threatened. Our panel tonight will discuss, in their view, the impact the proposed legislation will have on our community. You have the biographical sheets in your packets for details, so I will not be going through that. But I would like for you to join me in welcoming, and hold your applause, please, Greg Victor with the Arizona Hospital and Healthcare Association, Dr. Francisco Garcia with Pima County Health Department, Dr. Daniel Dirksen from the University of Arizona, Nancy Johnson from El Rio Health, and Dr. Tommy Sheckman, pediatrician from, and children's health advocate from Florida. Each panel.
So I have a lot of people who just kind of push us through. <laughs> Each panelist will speak for 10 minutes and then we will address your questions. Please use the question forms provided and hold them up in the air and one of our volunteers will collect the cards and bring them to me and I will share them with our panelists. Please do not hold up signs. Signs, not cards, will obstruct the view of the people here and make it difficult. We do have some seats in the front row here. It looks to me like we're, we're running out, so um, feel free to come up here. So as we move through this evening, remember to tweet, email, and share our message to the Arizona delegation of no on the BCRA. Okay, are we ready? All right, Greg, you're first. Good evening. That's kind of passive. Let's try that again. Good evening. There we go. So it's a great honor to be down here in Tucson. You know, the our association is based in Phoenix, and I just sort of inherited that when I moved down here. But I actually much prefer to come to Tucson. When we have meetings in Phoenix, nobody knows anybody. And down here, it's like cheers. Right? <laughs> everybody knows everybody. Half of you are probably related, right? I just don't understand it. Um, so, full disclosure, um, my organization is opposed to both the House and the Senate versions of trying to fix the Affordable Care Act. And I just want to disclose that because Judy actually asked me to try to lay out the issues and try to be objective about it. And I'll do my best, but I'm sure my bias will show around this a bit. So uh, let me do that. I'm trying to do it really quickly. It's a really big topic. We could be here all night just framing up the issues. Oh, no, we aren't. We're not going to be. There's a card out there that has a minute on it, and then I'm done. Um, so let's go back to 2010. That's when the Affordable Care Act passed, also called Obamacare. And this is a really big piece of legislation. You saw the pictures on TV of the big stack there. It actually did a whole bunch of things, and a lot of the things that it did most people have forgotten about. One was it really took this big approach to trying to somehow contain health care costs. And it actually did a reasonable job of bending the healthcare cost curve, actually the first time in my career where it's somewhat been flattened. That was missed a bit because it didn't really translate into necessarily reductions or a flattening in terms of health insurance premiums. So there's that. It also went on the other side. It made a major investment in public health intervention through a special fund, really looking to the future and trying to improve the health of Americans. And that's much longer term work, so we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. But again, a big part of the Affordable Care Act. But really the controversy is about the coverage pieces of the act, both in terms of people who got covered and how that got paid for. So let's talk about the two principal ways that the Affordable Care Act tried to provide coverage options for Americans. One was to get into what's called the individual insurance market and to try to make it work. So that's the market you go to if you don't get your health care coverage through work or through government programs like Medicare or Medicaid, which I'll cover. And what the Affordable Care Act tried to do is make a rational market out of that. It suffered from not being very rational for all of time. And that's one of the pieces that really had some problems in terms of getting going from the start and really serious problems in Arizona in terms of the offerings, both in terms of the rate of increase, uh, availability of options, things like that. The other thing that it did, though, was also provide some major subsidies for people in terms of buying them based upon income. And so even though the rates were going way up, um, the, the good news, if you're trying to buy, was you also got a big subsidy in many cases. Not so good for the federal budget, and that's where we start to get into some of the issues about how it gets paid for. So that was one round of the Affordable Care Act. The other had to do with Medicaid, an entitlement program created in 1965. And originally, Medicaid was really an adjunct of a welfare program, really. It was categorical approaches to trying to say this group of people are entitled to, to some things really starting with uh, single moms, right? And that was the way Medicaid worked for a long time. Only in the last 10 years or so has it really turned into what it is today, which is really a health coverage program, originally for the poor, but now it's actually for the poor and low income. And that's really because of the Affordable Care Act saying we're gonna actually incent states to actually expand their program to cover not just the poor, but people who are above the poverty level. And that brought in millions of people around the country. 
Um, it's really an important piece for Arizona because that's one of the things we did. Um, technically, it's called Medicaid expansion, but in Arizona, when we did it in 2013, it was actually restoring coverage to people who lost their coverage in the Great Recession, a state-only program uh, called Prop 204. Um, so those are the, the two things that were at play in terms of the Affordable Care Act originally. And then we had this thing happen last fall called an election, right? <laughs> and well, at least um, part of that election was about Obamacare and needing to repeal it. And so the people that won the election sort of came in with that as one of the things they said they would do. And there were polls that said well, getting rid of Obamacare would be a good thing to do. Um, and we'd support it. Of course, many of those people also said they liked the Affordable Care Act. And they really are the same things. I don't know how many saw the Jimmy Kimmel piece where they were debating people, do you like one or the other? And there was a choice at times. But uh, regardless, I think we have to accept that elections happen. Uh, our elected leaders came in and said, we're going to try to do something about this. Uh, the White House mostly delegated the policy of this to the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate. So first, a couple months ago, the House came out with their proposal called the American Health Care Act. And here's what they did to the features, um, the primary features of that. Essentially, in the individual insurance market, they changed the apparatus. Um, first of all, they changed the subsidies to tax credits. So if you're into tax policy, we could have a good debate. I'm not going to cover that tonight. More importantly, it actually a lot less dollars in terms of the money going to support people buying their coverage. They also changed some of the rating rules. So a lot of rationalizing that market was trying to say, here's how it will work in terms of rules of the road for insurers and people to buy the coverage through them. And one of the big things they did was really affect something called the age banding. And the practical reality of this, although we don't know exactly how it might play out if it goes into effect, is that if you're young and healthy, you will see the rates that you are paying now go down dramatically. If you're old and sick, you'll probably see your rates go up substantially. Some of the projections of that are kind of scary in terms of the rate of escalation for people over 50, for example. Um, the other thing it did, this was something that happened on the House floor, was really get into this question about pre-existing conditions and essential benefits. And the short version of this really is giving states some options to soften those rules of the road. Um, a lot of this is really about pre-existing conditions, and it's technically true that what the House did is um, nothing that would take away pre-existing conditions, but really what they said is that when you go to buy the coverage, which would be available, it just might cost you an incredible amount of money. And in fact, you might find out it doesn't include the benefits that you really need. Okay, so, and that's what the House did. Uh, let's go to Medicaid quickly. Um, what it does is essentially change the Medicaid program dramatically. It really um, ends it as we know it, meaning that long partnership going back to 1965, where the states and the federal government essentially split the cost of it. It turns it into a block grant program, and puts some significant caps on the rate of growth into the future. Um, in, to the tune of an $830 billion cut, I know we've seen some focus on that in recent days about there's no cut to the Medicaid program, the House bill has $830 billion in cuts. The third thing that the American Health Care Act did was a, a major tax cut, um, roughly $400 billion, and especially for wealthy Americans. So if you make $100,000 or so, or less than that, you're probably not going to see a dime of that. If you make up to $500,000, you might see a few hundred dollars of tax savings. If you make over 500,000 and more, you're going to see thousands and thousands. Yeah. So that moved over to the Senate, and uh, what we heard was that was going to be rejected and they were going to start all over. Well, the inside information we had was we didn't see that happening, and that's not what happened. The Senate came out with their proposal uh, roughly a week ago, late last week, and essentially it's just fiddling around on the edges of uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, although it has a new name the Better Care Reconciliation Act. <laughs> I didn't make that up. Um, just a couple comments about what it does a little bit differently than the House. In the individual insurance market, it softens that age rating thing, so it might be a little bit better in terms of if you're older and what you might have to pay going forward. Um, and it probably will take out the House provisions related to pre-existing conditions, essential benefits, things like that. In Medicaid, it just really makes a change of pushing out the start date to ending Medicaid expansion, which is part of changing the base of the Medicaid program. From the House bill, it pushes out the implementation basically a year, but it really does more than that in terms of the long term by taking money out steeper uh, as you get into the out years. So in fact, there's actually a much bigger drop over time in terms of the size of the Medicaid program in this nation. The tax cut um, untouched here, as we can tell, um, which I think will tell you a little bit about what this bill is really about. 
And then today we heard that there's a, a new piece, a six month waiting period. If you come into the insurance market without coverage, you'll have to wait six months before you can get any coverage. And it sounds like a requirement, as I read it, at least while I was um, not driving down here, but parking down here. Um, so, that's what's going on. Um, we expect the votes can take place this week, uh, probably Thursday, maybe Friday. Um, that's possible that won't happen, but there's a major effort by uh, Senate Republican leadership to really push this through because healthcare is sucking up all the oxygen in Washington, D.C., and nothing else is happening. Our position on this is opposed, and I'll just quickly say here's why. That's because, first of all, the impact on patients. Uh, the House bill is estimated to lead to 23 million Americans losing their health coverage, the Senate version 22 million, 300 to 400,000 Arizonans in all likelihood. And that's not going to be good for that. And I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about that. But it's also bad for the healthcare system. We lived this experience back in the Great Recession. So we know exactly what's going to happen in terms of hospital uncompensated care and how that's really going to reduce the stability of our health care system, both with the hospitals, the practitioners, and others. And the last but not least, we need to understand that health care actually is a huge part of Arizona's economy. It's actually one of the linchpins to it, especially a linchpin to the economic recovery here over the last few years, and it's going to do great damage to it. That's why we're opposed. And I'll turn it over to the next panelist. <laughs> always impressed with uh, people who can sort of encapsulate such a complicated thing that is healthcare. I'm Francisco Garcia, I'm the Assistant County Administrator for Health Services, and, and, and I'm here to sort of think about and help you process some of the public health implications, but I have to sort of take a step back as a person because, because access to care is very much um, an issue that has been a part of my medical education and my medical career. I remember being a uh, second year medical student, um, just got in, getting through the physiology class and, and, and visiting my parents and, and hear my dad in the other room drowning in his own secretions because he had congestive heart failure. And after 15 years of working for a company, he didn't have insurance. Um, and he didn't have a way to get taken care of. And I became an angry young man and ran away to D.C. And, and that's how my career in public health um, really started, uh, thinking about those access to care issues and working on the um, back then Senator Kennedy's uh, labor and human resources health policy staff. Back then we were talking about, back then my job as a very junior staffer was to review all the things that the senator had said previously. And I found it profoundly depressing to see year over year how many times the center had talked about how many millions of uninsured there were in, in the U.S. and to feel like this was an, uh, something that was unimaginable to fix. Um, fast forward to um, the election and um, the election of President Obama. Uh, something came true that, that many of us, certainly many people in my generation, had really thought that was quite impossible, and that is to create a right to health care access. Um, it, it was something unprecedented, certainly not unprecedented in the rest of the developing world, but certainly something unprecedented in this country. Um, uh, really, that created a novel new right for individuals. And, and, and that right is was a fundamental um, it was a fundamental landmark, really, in so many ways. I, I was telling someone that, to me, it was like it was like the Berlin Wall coming down and apartheid ending. Um, it had that kind of monumentality, at least in my head and in my history, because I know that that access to care and access to an insurance card doesn't necessarily mean that people are healthier or people are getting better, but it is a fundamental and requisite. A kind of component of health and well-being, and certainly of health and well-being in a community like ours, um, that any given year is either the fifth, sixth, or seventh, fourth large metropolitan area. That's why, that's why access to care matters. That's why access to care matters. And now there's some really, really good, compelling data from Massachusetts, from Oregon, from Hawaii that suggests that actually access to care in the form of insurance does actually decrease your mortality. 
But I will let um, Dan Dirksen and, and the rest of the team sort of talk about that. But let me share with you one important factoid. In, um, in 2012, one of the things that was created by the Affordable Care Act was um, the uh, Women's Preventive Services Task Force. And, and I was lucky enough to be asked by the National Academy of Medicine, back then the Institute of Medicine, to serve on that task force to define the package of preventive service benefits that would be um, included uh, with a uh, first dollar coverage as part of that. And, and that was a package that put together contraception as one of the essential covered benefits. That was monumental and historic and one of the most important things that any of us ever achieved in our careers. Heretofore, Contraceptive coverage was largely elective coverage that you had to pay on top of, or in some cases, go without. For us, for the folks who were involved in that process, giving women access to contraception and to family planning, as well as um, lactation support services and a variety of uh, eight other support services are, are really important. But that one thing is probably one of the most important public health interventions that we could use the healthcare environment to achieve. It's no mistake. It's no mistake that it's no mistake that we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years a, a decrease in adolescent pregnancy. That's not attributable to access to care. It is attributable to the tremendous investments that, has, that have been made by counties, by other public health entities across this country in creating an infrastructure for family planning. Pima County is either the has either the lowest or second lowest any given year adolescent pregnancy rate. Why is that? Because the county of Pima has taken money out of its own pocket, out of your pockets as taxpayers, and said contraceptive access and family planning are essential. And we need to provide it to adolescents, and we need to provide it to women, and we need to provide it to people with as little barriers as possible. The Affordable Care Act became kind of a, a beautiful complement to that kind of strategy. In fact, at the time the Affordable Care Act was being created, the vision was, oh, all these things that you public health departments are doing, you won't have to worry about that because we will do it. Because now you'll put people into primary care and they will take care of that. Your primary care provider. And that's really what we were all in. And as Michael Goforth and um, Judy and um, Nancy will tell you, all of us who partnered around the table to get people into coverage really were all in from the very beginning because we really believe, I really believe, that the best care is in a primary care setting. Um, and therefore, that's what we needed to achieve. But in the creation of the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that was done was that the substantial resources from the Centers for Disease Control were passed over into the Affordable Care Act structure. And those resources now will go away with the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. That is 40% of the health department budget potentially disappears over the next three years if there is a full repeal of the Affordable Care Act. What does that pay for? Adult immunizations, childhood immunizations. What does it pay for? It, uh, diabetes screens, diabetes education, chronic disease interventions. That's what it's paying for. So all those things start to fritter away. Our Well Women's Health Check, which is our breast and cervix and cancer prevention program, also on the chopping block. All of these essential things that were envisioned to someday be taken over by our primary care colleagues now go away because, because they are no longer a public health departments like our own will no longer have the funding to do that. So to us, this is personal. Right? For us, this is about the people in my community, the kids that go to school in my kids' elementary school. This is about all of us. And I think that one of the things that, that we have to keep in the front of our minds as we think about these very, very complex issues is that these involve real human beings and these involve um, real, um, real consequences to our system and real costs to our system. So as we think about how we move forward 
in whatever reality we move into, I, I, I don't believe, I, I, I don't believe that, um, I don't believe we're going to get past this. I, I don't believe the Affordable Care Act in its current state will continue to exist. It's already being dismantled bit by bit. So we either embrace this as an opportunity for greater partnership and creativity and, and let's all sort of put our thinking caps on to figure out how to best solve these solutions because these things, these problems that we face, whether it's um, adolescent pregnancy, whether it is low rates of immunization in some of our communities, um, whether it's how to respond to biological threats like Zika, all those things do not go away just because um, Washington thinks so. Really appreciate your attention. Thanks a lot. A little quicker for me. Yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. It's so great to see so many friends and advocates, uh, interested stakeholders uh, tonight. Um, wow, what a great turnout. Uh, and, uh, mine's not the dog one. Her dog pictures. Just click on the screen. Yeah. You thought you were going to escape without a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm, I'm sure and I, I made people very anxious this evening doing this at the last minute, but I have a good excuse. I was waiting for the Congressional Budget Office analysis to come out, which just came out uh, two or three hours ago. And the title of my presentation, I think, is apropos as we enter monsoon season, weathering the perfect storm, Arizona's rural health in peril. I'm going to focus on rural health. I'm a family physician by training. And I teach in the College of Public Health, and I wasn't nervous until I'm meeting my boss for the first time here in the front row. And welcome. All right, and that's my animation. The title going down there. Here's what just came out uh, last week, and we're looking at it. The Congressional Budget Office just came. This is my excuse for the procrastination until an hour ago to get these done. But it looks like, uh, very much like the House bill, we're going to increase in the first year by 15 million uninsured, that by uh, the 10 year uh, period, which they always do in congressional budget, up, take about 10 years, about 22 uh, million, uh, which is very similar to the House bill of 23 million. And we cut over a trillion dollars over the next 10 years in health funding for coverage. And the biggest chunk comes out of the most vulnerable populations in Medicaid cuts over the next 10 years. Um, and also one that uh, Francisco and I are very concerned about is cutting a billion dollars a year from the CDC budget, who in turn uh, contracts with us at the state level to do things like uh, public health preparedness for Zika virus and Ebola virus, and for uh, addressing the issues Governor Ducey has uh, called to action for us on the opioid uh, overdose and collateral damage from the morbidity and mortality of that epidemic in our part of the country. So who's at risk? And I say, who's at risk? 38% of Americans, and there's not a person in this uh, audience who doesn't have a family member or friend who's going to be affected by some of the changes proposed. Of our 323 million population in the United States, 123 million are covered by Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or Medicare. And there's a breakdown, Medicaid 70 million right now today, a Children's Health Insurance Program, which we call Kids Care in Arizona, we call Medicaid in Arizona Access, 57 million Americans on Medicare, and there's the dual eligibles. This is the very difficult to care for population, very expensive, who are on both Medicaid and Medicare. And uh, having just gone through this in our family, you know, when you have a parent uh, that requires assisted living or a disabled child, these are huge issues. And uh, so I want to make sure everyone understands what's at stake here. Who else is at risk? And this is my focus uh, to you, is the rural, the elderly, and the disabled. We know that in rural areas we have fewer providers, that we have poor health outcomes, higher uninsured rates, higher poverty, and an older population. So rural is going to be particularly hard hit. And these contribute to the significant health disparities that we see in access to health services and also coverage as far as Medicaid and marketplace, but especially for rural, border, elderly, and Latino populations. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I was asked to speak before the Ways and Means uh, Committee in D.C. And at the time, I was in the airport, 
and I got news that one of our rural critical access hospitals was closing, and I used that as an anecdote. They got a lot of press all over. And one of the points I tried to make is you don't save money throwing people off coverage. You just shift the cost to individuals, families, and health providers, and it worsens health outcomes. And I think that's the bottom line for a lot of us. I'm a family physician, and full disclosure, I'm a lifelong registered Republican, but I truly believe as a family physician that everyone should have coverage and access to high quality care. Why is Arizona? Why is Arizona at particular risk uh, by these bills uh, in Congress right now? We have the third highest rate of growth in our low income elderly population. And this makes it, those states with that, and these are the five top states, you notice uh, kind of in this part of the world, um, are really going to be punished by these per capita or block grant methodologies. So we have to pay particular attention in Arizona to these issues. And I'm really worried about these two eligibility categories in Medicaid. They only make up 24% of the enrollees in the 70 million on Medicaid currently in our country. But they account for 63% of the costs. Very hard to, for states to absorb a trillion dollar cuts in federal Medicaid funding to state Medicaid programs when you have these populations that you're responsible for and that we're responsible for as Americans. Here's where we are right now in Arizona, and this is the other reason we're at risk. Arizona would be punished by the House AHCA, the Senate BCRA, and the President's budget because Arizona expanded access coverage and is already very cost efficient. Look at where we're at. We're the eighth lowest in per capita federal spending. And because the per capita cap would be based on previous year's experience, we'd be punished for being very cost efficient. And by the way, our health outcomes are as good for our Medicaid population, our access population, and better than most states. So why would we be punished for doing the right thing? The American uh, Health Care Act or the Senate Better Reconciliation Act would do these things. It goes beyond repealing Obamacare. This repeals a fundamental piece of the Social Security Act that created Medicaid in 1965. In that provision of the Social Security Act, the federal government is on the hook for 50% at a minimum of a state's Medicaid costs. In Arizona, because our per capita income is significantly lower than the United States average, our federal medical assistance right now for Medicaid is almost 70%. So we take a huge cut under per capita of funding in addition to the other factors I mentioned. It creates this per person cap, and what it does is it shifts Medicaid from federal entitlement side of budget funding each year to the yearly appropriations battles in the discretionary side of the budget. And that's huge. Every year, we'd be vulnerable to further cuts in addition to the trillion dollars being proposed in this bill. It would end access to Medicaid for 400,000 in Arizona. This is posted, by the way, on our Arizona Center for Rural Health. I have a lot more slides on this. If you want data and you want to do primary source verification, I know some of the folks here are, uh, are doing things for print media will want to see some of this. It will cut over this period of time $7 billion in federal funding to Arizona. How do you make up the difference? How do you provide the benefits to our rural, our elderly, our blind and disabled with $7 billion in cuts? It would double our uninsured and return to the days of 1.2 million uninsured Arizonans, and it would double our uncompensated and charity care for our rural uh, and, uh, and uh, critical access hospitals as well as our urban underserved hospitals. The Senate version is actually worse. It has steeper cuts to Medicaid than the House bill, and it's because it links it to the consumer price index for urban, and here's the formula for that. On average, over the last 10 years, the consumer price index for urban was about 1.7% per year, whereas the medical was almost twice that at 3.2%. And when you're spending $345 billion each year, and you cut and you add just the, the ideas that you'd add 3.2% in the House version, that's a little better. You'd add 11 billion a year, so a state would have more. Versus the Senate version, which is the consumer price index for urban, is only 5.9. And the problem with the Senate version is that's compounded each year. Each year, you get another set of cuts on top of the ones there. So uh, that's why you're seeing these huge savings to the federal deficit uh, in some of the CBO uh, uh, analysis. This is my last slide. I took this slide after a monsoon uh, uh, downpour in Soro National Line. And I, I came up with a poem just for this conference, which uh, I'm, I'm going to do here. Time repeals our boastful leaders. 
and their Dalton Towers tumble, lies unmask these poison feeders, truth <laughs> reveals and renders, renders humble. And I want to point out, I didn't mean this, but if you look at some of those cacti there, you notice they kind of have the, like their middle finger there? That's like Cisco and Eva right there. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you this evening and uh, appreciate everybody coming out. My name is Nancy Johnson. I'm a nurse by my original education and I'm the CEO at El Rio Community Health Center. So as you might imagine, I'm bringing a different flavor to this conversation this evening. And I'm always so impressed by all our policy folks that have all the big data numbers and study these bills in intensity. But every day, myself and approximately 1,100 other people who work at El Real Community Health Center see the face of the folks that really need our support and our help. So, you know, before we talk, uh, my assignment was to talk about what losses would we expect around primary care and also around women's health. And you heard the big picture from my fellow panelists, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the gains, the gains we have made since the passage of the Affordable Care Act and what things we have in our community that are just amazing because these gains are what are at risk going forward. And as many of you know, El Rio is a unique <coughs> Medicaid provider. We take care of over 56,000 Medicaid recipients currently. One in almost every 10 Tucsonans gets their health care through El Rio Community Health Center across the community. A lot of people we take care of. And as I mentioned, 56,000 of them are on Medicaid. We also have about another 10,000 that remain uninsured. Despite changes in legislation, despite access to care, we still have about 10,000 people we take care of every day without any form of coverage. And as you know, we are a unique Medicaid payer in that we take care of everyone who comes through our doors, whether they have an insurance payer or whether they have no, no source of payment. So we kind of have this front line to the community in terms of everything from the opioid epidemic to the rising prices of insulin for diabetics. So a, a great place to be studying what's going on in our community. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a, a, just a story to begin with. And this story came from one of our very passionate providers. We have a lot of our providers that are blogging and writing about their concerns because on a daily basis, they see the ravages from patients who've had no access to care, to Francisco's point. But this patient, you know, had been uninsured most of his adult life. With the passage of the Affordable Care Act, he came into our health center and registered for care. His only engagement with health care over the years had really been episodic. You know, something acute came, didn't resolve itself, he sought an urgent care or an urgent care. Now that he's a patient at El Rio, his first visit unveiled a couple unhappy, um, unhappy pieces of information. One, he had high blood pressure, undiagnosed high blood pressure. Second, he had undiagnosed diabetes type 2. But he became a patient and, you know, his care, primary care, we're talking about primary care, regular visits with a provider, but also having time with a nurse to talk about education, managing blood pressure, time with our pharmacist to learn about managing diabetes and having access to those needed medications. This gentleman, who we see regularly, is a low risk in the healthcare system. He's costing us hardly any money. We're taking great care of him. If Medicaid is rolled back, he won't have that access to care. He most likely will not have regular access to his medications and he won't have that regular primary care. Actually, he will. We will see him for no, for no money, but we will work hard as a team to help him not fall through the cracks. The other piece is his wife, who's also our patient, and she sees one of our certified nurse midwives for her annual one woman check. During that, she has access to mammography, she has access to pap smears, all kind of cancer screenings, and she has access to affordable contraception. That's another loss, big loss we'll have around women's health is that access to affordable contraception for women in our community. 
So that's a little story, just about two people, two of those 56,000 people that we see at El Rio. So what will we lose in primary care? Kind of made bullet points of everything at risk for us. The essential health care benefits are at risk, access to the preventive care, access to um, all aspects of prevention in terms of, in Pima County, I believe it's about 122,000 adults, about 90,000, 95,000 children will lose access to that primary preventive care. The rollback on Medicaid expansion, um, as um, Dan said, hugely impactful in both bills. I think the Senate bill is the most egregious, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And, you know, this is critical to the lives of so many people that we've enrolled. And what are we going to do as a state? Are we going to raise taxes? Are we going to have more people in the emergency rooms? We know we will have an increase in charity care that we provide in our organization. I think one of the other things we'll lose, which is huge, is the stunning drop we've seen in the percentage of uninsured. You know, prior to the Affordable Care Act of our patient population, nearly 100,000 individuals, about 30% of them were uninsured. After the Affordable Care Act, we're down to a stunning 10% uninsured at the end of 2016. We also have concerns about what happens with pre-existing conditions. We're worried about patients needing access to primary care and being on a six-month wait list. Uh, we're very concerned about the age ratios. You know, I think in one of the articles that I was brushing up and reading, we were looking at average cost of care for people from age 50 to 64. Currently, it's about $1,700 a year. And under the House bill, it would rise to 14,600 per year from the CBO office, from the Congressional uh, Budget Office. While younger people, ages 20 to 30, would see a drop from 1,700 a year to 1,450. A big piece of loss will be around disease prevention in primary care. Our ability to optimize the health of probably 50% of our population over age 50 that have at least one chronic condition, if not more. So, um, pretty devastating. Um, I think that, uh, to an earlier point, Arizona has been a model access program, a model Medicaid program. Efficient, fabulous outcomes, just in our population alone, we've been able to drive down use of emergency rooms and unnecessary hospitalizations by about 25% year over year. It's a huge cost savings to the healthcare system in giving us access to populations that need healthcare. So lastly, what about women's care? What's at risk? Obviously, contraception that we've talked about. We also have anxiety about the mandate to cover maternity care in that regard, in that many women might not have access to prenatal care. And lastly, contraception will continually become financially out of reach, so many more unplanned pregnancies. So lastly, I just encourage you all to help us keep these gains that we've made through the Affordable Care Act in improving the health of our community through support. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it's so amazing to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Tommy Sheckman. I am a pediatrician who sees children, sees children every single day. And in my spare time, I'm quite uh, active politically as an advocate, um, both in the legislative arena and the public arena. Let me first start, because when we talk about children, children, no matter where they were born, no matter where they live, they need our support. Because as the axiom goes, children don't vote. But we, everyone sitting in this audience, need to speak up and support children. How many of you are parents? How many grandparents? All right. That means at least four out of every 10 here has a child who is on Medicaid. If we look at specifically just here in Arizona, I think in congressional district number two, I may have this a little bit messed up on the congressional districts, but 31% of children are on Medicaid in congressional district number three, 44%. More concerning is that 6% of children in congressional district two are uninsured and of close to 11% in congressional district uh, three. 
We have made huge progress in this country in getting children insured. Almost 95% of children are now finally insured. But that still leaves 5% of children that do not have insurance across the country, regardless of where they are. That's not that child's fault. The child does not have a choice. And parents should not have to make a choice. Parents should not have to make a choice between working, putting food on the table, putting heat, or in this condition, air conditioning, I don't know how to say that, uh, uh, running those fans, and, and, and or choosing health care for their child. And that's something that we are asking parents every single day to do. And that is something that is just morally wrong. We, as a country of so many resources, need to show compassion and have a moral compass that says we are going to take care of our most precious resource, our children. You know, there are lots of numbers, lots of stories. I see children every single day, parents every day, that we can certainly talk about. But at the end of the day, we have an obligation to provide the opportunity, the maximum opportunity for our children to succeed. And simply what is going on in the halls of Congress today is nothing more than bait and switch. It is clear that what people in Washington are doing is failing our children and therefore failing our country. There. This has gone beyond the replacement of the Affordable Care Act, as many on this panel have spoken about. This is about trying to gut Medicaid. This is going beyond what happened in 2010. And this goes back many, many years. And we need to stand up and speak out to make sure that everyone, uh, of course as a pediatrician, I'm most concerned about children, but I'm also concerned about their parents and grandparents. Because when we know that when parents get health care, their children get health care. And, and that's an important thing that we need to recognize. We need to understand that children that are in foster care do not have a choice but to be on Medicaid because they are, because they are not adopted. Their private insurers will not cover them. Um, one of our risks, I think people have spoken tonight about losing essential uh, health benefits. And one of the things that we must recognize is that children are not just small adults, they have particular needs. And those needs include appropriate screening, developmental assessments, diagnostics and treatment. A program called EPSDT was installed in this country 50 years ago. And little known to, even to me until I started reading a little bit more in the past few days and getting prepared for tonight, the reason EPSDT, which is, which is the core of Medicaid for children, is it's, it was because in the uh, 1960s, 50 years ago, when draftees were being uh, screened to go into Vietnam, into the Vietnam War, 50% of draftees failed, flunked their basic health screening. It was that bad. We could not bring in soldiers to support our efforts of, uh, throughout in Vietnam at that time. So a program called EPSD was created. It made sure that every child who, would, who was on Medicaid got early and recurrent and periodic screening and the treatment they need. We stand to lose that standard of care. We stand to lose making sure that all children, not just children on Medicaid, but children with commercial health, get those essential benefits, such as early hearing screening, vision screening, mental health screening. Mental health is something else that we are very concerned about when it comes to children. 20% of children have meet the criteria for a mental health diagnosis, 20%. 20% of those children uh, receive treatment. Most of those treatment drop, most of those children drop out of treatment because they don't have means of access to care. One of the things that we recognize that is so wonderful about Medicaid, it provides not only the access, but the means for parents to get their children there. Something very few people know is that Medicaid provides transportation. So if you need to get your child to the doctor, to the specialist, it will call a taxi, maybe now some of them will call an Uber, but the fact is they're getting you to the doctor. We will lose that, and that is a concern. 
we will lose, I think Francisco brought up first dollar coverage. First dollar coverage has sort of been ignored in the recent weeks of debate, but that means that you don't pay anything, both for children, for adults, for anyone, for well care, for well child care, well adult care. And most importantly, it will cover the first dollar of all vaccines. As a practicing pediatrician, I have seen an amazing increase in vaccination rates since the Affordable Care Act came into effect. The reason is, parents used to say, well, one, is that vaccine required to get my kid into school? Because at the end of the day, that's all they want to do is get their kids into school because they don't want them at home. But the fact <laughs> is, yeah, the truth be told. So, but the fact is, they also want to know whether or not that vaccine was going to be paid for. And often, depending on their insurance plan, it wasn't. Today, that's no longer a question. Every child will get and receive vaccines. And our return on investment in vaccines is critical. There have been, you know, not only do we have outbreaks when children are not vaccinated, and we've had a recent outbreak here in Arizona several years ago with measles, the most recent one with the Somalia community in Minnesota. We expect those outbreaks to increase if we start losing our vaccination rates. But most importantly, and this speaks to our investment in our future, is that every dollar spent on vaccines returns $10.10 in return on that investment. So again, we are not just investing today, we're investing in our future. And finally, we need to think about what it means to raise healthy adults. I partner every day with my parents. And, and part of that journey that we take is to look at the future. We invest today, we are looking at preventive care. And it also means that we're keeping children healthy so they can perform well in school. Schools are our future, education is our future, but children cannot learn if they're not healthy. And we must maintain that healthiness. And we must maintain it so we have a strong America tomorrow and that we as a nation will develop our future leaders and offer them that opportunity to thrive and grow. Finally, I just want to leave um, just a couple words about a couple stories. And actually these are stories about my own employees in my own office. Um, one of the things that the American Academy of Pediatrics is really trying to point out that everybody views Medicaid as an entitlement program. We see it as an empowerment program. We are empowering parents to be able to work with their kids to work. To work. To work. To work. Thank you. And, and, and the fact is, you know, um, I have two, well, let me just tell you quickly about a couple of people who work for me. I have one mother who now, who is a medical assistant that works for me, and she was on Medicaid. Her child, who uh, is two years old and has autism, um, was on Medicaid because she's now working for me and she is supporting a family of eight that live in her household, five of which, or five of whom, excuse me, are undocumented. But the fact is, is that she was kicked off of Medicaid because simply she now earned $100 too much. And, and, and my point there being is now her child has no resource to be able to get the, um, the care that he needs which children with autism early on need a lot of intensive care. I have two other mid-level workers that work for me, and the only reason they can work is because they get benefit from Medicaid. They have private insurance, one of which, uh, one of whom the father actually works for a top one, Fortune 100 company, receives private insurance, but without their Medicaid benefits, Medicaid provides what's called med waiver. It may be called something different here in Arizona, but it's simply, certainly a federal program, and also PCS, patient-centered services. They are able to work because there's someone at home taking care of their kids. These parents have to pay extra so their kids can go to summer camp because they have to pay for an aid to be able to have their kid at camp because their children may run off from the camp. So the bottom line is we need to support our children, and I implore you as I'm being kicked off, that yeah, you all pick up that phone, pick up that tweet, and ask your senators to think about Arizonans and all U.S. children. Thank you. So it is now seven o'clock. We are committed to um, answering your questions for three minutes. I appreciate the fact that many of you have given us questions on these cards. I've had a chance to look at them quickly. 
A couple of them are just downright funny. Um, and hopefully we'll have time for those too. Uh, but I'm going to try to get to the ones that, um, that I think that we can answer best and use our best, uh, the best use of our time tonight. So the first one is, can you describe how the BCRA would impact mental and behavioral health care in Arizona? And we actually have three people who have asked us specifically about how this bill would affect behavioral health. So I'm going to ask for volunteers first, and if I don't get one, maybe Francisco. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering. I'm, I'm happy to give you my take, and, and it, I think one of the things that, that both proposals, whether it's the House or the Senate proposal, opens up is the possibility of states tailoring their benefit package. And whereas many of us who, who've worked in, with behavioral health populations really kind of smile when people talk about uh, mental health parity, we, we haven't quite achieved it, we were a hell of a lot closer uh, under the Affordable Care Act than we've ever been. Uh, under the, the two uh, proposed pieces of legislation, states would have the option of readjusting their packages so that it, they could make their, those benefits less, um, you know, less generous. I think uh, the, the bottom line is with a trillion dollars less over 10 years, uh, some benefits are going to go and unfortunately it seems like we have a pattern of uh, letting go of behavioral health, especially the integration, which I think is critical of behavioral and and primary care and other services. So we've made a huge amount of progress in Arizona and I just don't want to see us going backwards. Mm -hmm. But even if the benefits don't go away, the coverage will, given the numbers you were sharing. So um, a lot of the access to that care is actually through Medicaid eligibility and there's gonna have to be a day of reckoning in terms of the numbers uh, and probably pretty severe hundreds of thousands in fact, right. many of whom need those services. Yes, and I, th I think that's the other thing we've heard from small behavioral health providers. They really don't envision they will be able to continue to provide services with the drastic cuts to Medicaid. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, what should I tell a Republican friend who says he has read the Senate bill and that all Medicaid covered people under ACA are grandfathered in? So they will not be harmed by the new bill. <laughs> and and we, respectfully, I, I do think we've answered this to some degree, but I do think that a lot of us get that question. And, um, and I would say that, that one of the reasons you're here tonight is so that you can answer this question from a position of facts instead of fiction. Because there's a lot of information out there that a lot of people believe about what is implied by this bill. Would anybody on the panel like to illuminate that further? I'd just make a point on the churn uh, that's natural to Medicaid is people get jobs and they get employer-sponsored insurance and they go back. Uh, someone in their family uh, loses coverage. The natural turnover of this is about every three years. Mm -hmm. So you can grandfather folks in and just wait them out mm -hmm. and then suddenly you have more and more uninsured accumulating over time. And, and I see that uh, right in the middle of both of these bills uh, where people lose coverage and that's why the Congressional Budget Office for both this bill, the Senate bill, uh, loss of 22 million over the next 10 years and House bill 23 million, they're, they're very similar, but 14 or 15 million in 2018. This is a very steep drop off right away, especially in Arizona. It's a cliff. Mm -hmm. I think one other comment on that is that if we go to a cap program or even worse yet, a block grant program, um, even if you are covered by Medicaid or covered under any kind of care form, there's just going to be less money and the states will have to decide how to ration care. And the fact is, is that we're going to leave it up to states to make decision and policy uh, that is uh, right now governed by federal statutes that guarantee certain essential benefits. And states either are not going to be able to afford it because there's just going to be less money in the system or they're going to choose to regulate differently. Waiting lists. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. So even if you're covered, uh, there may not be, I think with Greg was saying, there's not going to be funds to, right. to pay for the services. Yeah. Or what those services are. Correct. So narrowing in on those. You know, we spent a lot of time, uh, we spent a lot of time with those patients reaching out and not letting them fall off the cliff. 
Time to enroll. Don't fall off of Medicaid. And we envision we have to go down that path again to protect uh, all the folks on Medicaid. Okay, so. next question. How can medical centers like TNC help to bring down the cost of medical care? And I think I may be qualified to answer that question. <laughs> uh, I also have a colleague here, uh, Dr. Dan McCain, who runs our county our care organization, who would have a lot to say about this as well. But as I've told many, many people over the last several years, our vision and our mandate in an acute care hospital has changed over the last several years with the Affordable Care Act because we are now penalized financially when people are readmitted and when bad things happen to them in the hospital. So we are being incentivized by this program to keep people out of the hospital and to not readmit them. And this is the Medicare population I'm talking about specifically that has these penalties. So our our reaction and our response to everything that has been going on since we started our accountable care organization and since we've seen a change from a volume reimbursement, which is every time you take care of somebody you get paid for it, if they have coverage, to a value proposition where we are being judged and paid by the value and the care that we provide. So we will continue to do that, as will every other hospital in our community. Okay, the next question. If the repeals don't work or pass, will I still have insurance through the Affordable Care Act next year? So 2018. Well, that's one of the things that I worry about is because even even under the best case scenario, I, I really believe that this election has really transformed the, the, the marketplace uh, tremendously. I, I don't know that we ever go back to the Affordable Care Act. Um, this administration in, uh, is, is dismantling um, pieces of the Affordable Care Act through administrative rulemaking, uh, bit by bit by bit. Um, it's their prerogative to do. It's it's an executive prerogative to, to change those administrative rules, um, and and I really believe that, that that we are we will be even worse off than we have ever been, um, even in, in, under that scenario. Well, so far, um, you know, Bernie Sanders ought to be happy. We have single payer in Arizona for our marketplace, right? Blue Cross Blue Shield, in 13 counties. And, and better for FEMA and Maricopa. But um, so far, uh, those two uh, entities at least have uh, signaled that they, they want to stay in it. Structurally, there's no uh, flaw in the system as far as they can increase rates if, they're, if their bottom line isn't making it. So each year they can go to the Department of Insurance and ask for increases. Um, so I think we could do better uh, by some very uh, mundane things at the federal level by making these multi-year contracts like we do with our access program. I mean, why not learn from what we're doing well? Uh, and, and so insurers can guarantee that they have a book of business for several years and they can build an adequate contractual network to make sure people have access to the hospitals, the physicians, the nurses, and the other health providers that they want in their network. So I, I think that uh, I, maybe uh, I just don't see an upside in pessimism. I, I really believe that we can build on the momentum that we're doing and that um, uh, should people uh, realize after the CBO score today and, and get very nervous about what happens two years from now or six years from now if you're in the House or the Senate, that maybe they'll pay attention to those things they can do to actually make things better, not make them worse. Thank you. Okay, our next question is a pre-existing condition question, I'm thinking right. Okay. How are pre-existing conditions treated in the Senate bill? Well, the Senate seems intent politically on not um, sort of getting gouged by the same criticism of the House on this issue. So I think we expect that provision to move out. But again, it's a fluid process. If you don't know if the Senate vote moves forward this week, how this works is they will they'll go to the floor and they have something called votorama, which will be an endless array of amendments um, until they're done. And so it's in, within that process that we'll find out the real answer to the question is what's in the votorama? That's a fair answer to a tough question. I have already 
been denied services once in my life for a pre-existing condition. What is there to prevent this from happening again? Ditto. We don't know. That's truly a question that we do not have the answer to. Well, I, there's one thing we're saying, which is we still have the, um, the federal laws and the state laws regarding emergency room access yes. for not-for-profit hospitals. That really is, historically, the backbone of access in the state and this nation. And those laws still are in place. We still have a right to care through that. It's just for emergency care, and it's, it does create this huge problem. Your diabetes example is a classic one, is that we hope they go to your clinics even if you're taking care of them for free. But if they don't, they'll be showing up at the emergency room with heart problems, stroke problems, um, limb problems that are really expensive and you really just can't deal with it. So um, yeah, there, there's ways we deal with this, but there are really poor ways. So the Intel legislation that Greg is referencing is the one that says that somebody walks into an emergency room and we will screen them and we will provide them with whatever emergency care they require. It is considered, in my view, an unfunded mandate because whether there's funding or not, we will continue to do that. And that is one of the reasons we're so concerned about the future. So the next question is regarding Mitch McConnell, who if any of you are looking at your phones, you know that things are blowing up right now about Mitch McConnell, but we're not going to take a position on that because it's just all news. Mitch McConnell said that they are not receiving a lot of phone calls against this act. <laughs> so what's the problem? Now that's a quote that somebody in the audience gave and I actually recognize this name and I believe that she correctly quoted Mitch McConnell. So what's the problem? So this particular citizen of this community said, please ask people to, you've got really bad handwriting, I'll find you later. <laughs> I know who you are. Please ask people to call their senators and tell them to get help. So, their messages are full. They're, yes, in fact, I got a, a message all along that said that Senator Flake had a new phone number. <laughs> My, my thought was that they're, they're being overrun, so they had to actually add more phone calls because it doesn't make us happy when we can't get through. Okay, um, how will the Senate bill impact children in our community that utilize county services or have disabilities? Francisco. I, I'm trying to figure out how to word this uh, factually correct. Well, first of all, we, we won't know exactly what's going to happen until it happens, right? So, but but here's how I'm thinking about it. Um, so, in, in the short term, it's you're not going to see an impact. In the short term, we will continue to do this, but but in the not so distant future, uh, our county board of supervisors, or our state legislature, is going to be faced with a, a choice. Um, in the state of Arizona, we require certain vaccinations are, uh, as compulsory prior to entry into school. So that becomes the responsibility of that in statute is the responsibility of the county. So how does the county pay for it? Uh, that becomes the conversation that our electeds are going to have to have if this sort of goes down in, um, if, if this continues to move forward. Um, there are a variety of obligations. Historically, counties have, have provided a safety net and have supported safety net hospitals um, throughout the country, and, and this county is, is no exception. With the advent of access, most counties got, up, got out of the business of actual provision of care and have continued to go down that road. Um, and that's a good thing. We want, we want we want doctors, we want nurses, we want professionals to do that care delivery. But what happens when there is not adequate reimbursement and people start turning to public resources, to government? Uh, I think it's going to put a strain. Um, I think it's, it's going to lead to uh, our electeds uh, really facing some tough choices uh, with regards to whether to use taxation as a, a means of uh, funding those services that they're mandated to provide. Tommy, you 
Well, I, I think that you're absolutely right. We don't know the details, but what I can say is that um, throughout this country, we have long waits and difficult, and this goes not only for children who are on Medicaid, but even with commercial insurance to get special services. For them, often there can be a two to three year wait to get appropriate ABA services. There's just not enough providers. There's not enough mental health providers. There often, again, I'll speak in Florida, and I'm not sure it's uh, particulars here, but it's pretty much the same throughout the country. Uh, children in my community may have to drive 90 miles to see a specialist. Um, and that's true often for children who uh, have commercial, but for sure children on Medicaid. So it's a concern. One of the, uh, again, bait and switches that the um, Senate did was they said, we'll carve out um, and we'll take children who have disabilities out of the sort of issue of caps. Um, well, and so they thought that was going to be sort of that bait and switch and giving us a sort of a bone. But the problem is, is if you totally decimate, which is what this is projected to do, the funding and the services within Medicaid, it won't matter. There won't be any funds, even if they're carved out, for states to be able to provide those services for children with disabilities. Um, and I think the one statement I do also want to add to all of that that is very clear um, to those of us who care for children, and that speaks of everybody in this room, every parent, but also pediatricians. And I will say that pediatricians know best what children need, not politicians. And that's something that has been happening. They absolutely know, from my knowledge, and, it's, and I deal with the folks at National, um, any kind of conversation with American Academy of Pediatrics, American Association of Family Physicians, any uh, health, American Hospital Association, anybody knowing how to who take care of kids, and, and that's what's most despicable. Okay, so a trillion dollars out of the system is still a trillion dollars out of the system. Correct. Right. Okay, has anyone on the repeal side figured out how many healthcare jobs will evaporate in every state? Great. You're the evaporation <laughs> job specialist. Well, um, we've been trying to figure it out in Arizona and nationally with the American Hospital Association. Um, it's a lot of projecting, but it's a lot of jobs, thousands and thousands of jobs in Arizona. I wouldn't try to put a, an actual number on it because it's just the assumptions about it. But there's just no doubt that we're going to have, I, I think, large-scale layoffs across the state in hospitals to start with. I've talked to CEOs. They don't want to do it, but once the, the funding cutbacks kick in, there's going to be no choice but to really figure out how to lean dramatically, and that's what you're hearing all across the nation. So significant. Mm -hmm. During, yeah. oops, During the Great Recession, Arizona was one of the states hit worst uh, by the recession. We're uh, in the bottom five states as far as job loss. For the last five years, Arizona has been in the top five states as far as job gains, and the largest gains have been in the health sector. When Governor Brewer was talking about this, and she's not a dynamic public speaker uh, by any means, but she's staying on message, and she said, you know, do the math. This is 250,000 people. This is 20,000 jobs. This is two and a half billion dollars per year. Those numbers uh, still serve us today. I think those are in the ballpark of what we're seeing from the Congressional Budget Office. So I would say a, 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 a very conservative estimate would be that if these things went through, at the end of the day, we'd lose 20 to 25,000 jobs in the health sector in Arizona. So I was just seeing a study by the Commonwealth, and it was about 55,000 for Arizona that we cited. So on, on the yeah. other end of the street. Yeah. That's, that's what I was looking at. That's range. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that, um, we are not here to speak hyper, hyperboles tonight. We are not here to incite anything. Our goal and our passion is to give you information that is accurate. And the panelists are being careful, I think, uh, that we don't give you what we consider to be something that would incite somebody to be angry but may not be completely factually true. So I, I appreciate that from everybody. So we have to do one of these. And we've had a couple. What is the opinion of the panelists concerning single-payer, universal health care? Uh, nobody wants that one. 
Blue Cross Blue Shield for all, is that what we're talking well, about? Well, he did, he did mention that they are the only ones left in the marketplace, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll sort of take it because... Thank you, Francisco. It's a, it's a tough question. So, it's a tough question. I, I remember, again, being a, a young staffer and, and sort of looking at, you know, what other um, countries, what other developed countries were using and, and trying to scratch my head. Why, what was it about our ethos as a country that precluded a single payer? Um, and, and what was it about... Um, the you know the, the American ethic uh, that that said that that was something that was undesirable, and I think part of it has to do with our individualism and our reluctance to be told what to do. The ACA that 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 was the downfall, right? That is the rallying cry. I don't want to be told to buy insurance or not, um, whether rightly or wrongly. That that has been the downfall. I think that we are still a ways, at the time I remember telling somebody, I think things have to get worse before they get better. Um, when people start sort of feeling that pinch, um, when everybody starts feeling that pinch, that's when it starts to make more sense. I actually think that, that the Affordable Care Act, with its sometimes significant limitations, was actually a really sane, rational, middle-of-the-road, market-oriented kind of solution that achieved a lot of the goals that had been set forth. Um, and so I actually think that that, that was a good solution um, and that was a realistic solution. Um, and I, I long for the day when we can sort of get back there, um, although I don't see it quite yet. Nevada did an interesting bill, although the governor just vetoed it. Uh, yeah, this is the Medicaid for all. We've heard a lot about Medicare for all. And uh, Will Hummel and I wrote a little editorial piece in the Arizona Republic. I, I think it would actually be an interesting model. You know, from the beginning, Arizona has rechanneled its Medicaid business to private health insurance vendors. Yes. Uh, Medicare Advantage is rechanneled through private health insurance vendors. TRICARE, which people are very satisfied with, at least the folks in it, are rechanneled through private vendors. The difference is we do it through multi-year contracts. Right. We make sure the insurers have the biz book of business, but we hold them accountable for access standards and having an adequate health provider and hospital system network. So there's ways to get there, whether it's Medicaid for all, Medicare for all, or using the German system or, or the Canadian system or some other, but I think for the amount we spend, 3.2 trillion a year and growing, we should be expecting much better value uh, for the dollars we spend. Thank you. Thank you. Dan made with this slide, it sort of always escapes people, but, but it is really important. Um, we actually have a pretty lean and mean system in Arizona in terms of our It's not mean. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it is a, a, a very it's efficient system. Um, and, and, what, and, and, and one of the things that, that really sort of is troubling is that both of these attempts at, at repeal and reform uh, really penalize that efficiency. Um, you can't get the same kind of care in Massachusetts and Boston for what you get here in Arizona. And it has to do with a whole bunch of market forces. Um, and, but, but, but I think that all the excess has been pretty much wrung out of um, the access system. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there is a lot more uh, fat to get out of it. Um, I think that, that providers are on that fine line right now. Um, and I think that, that it still could, is a good value proposition for most <laughs> providers. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to see us penalized for, for actually having a fairly high performing kind of um, system. We're not perfect, but uh, we think we uh, have been very cost efficient. So um, I'm going to address one last question and then uh, we're, going to, we're going to close our session tonight. Uh, the last question that I'm going to address is regarding the rising cost of medications. When we agreed several years ago to sign on as a hospital industry to the Affordable Care Act, we did it at the same time that the pharmacies, the pharmaceutical companies, and the medical device companies agreed to contribute 
the dollars through reductions that it would take to pay for these expansions. In this new bill, there are no give backs to the hospitals, to the health care providers, to the physicians that were given up in order to pay for the Affordable Care Act. But there are restorations to pharmaceuticals and medical device companies. And so another very concerning piece of health care for all of us is how we're going to continue to pay for drugs that we believe when they hit home, when they are needed for our mother, our father, our child, our sister, our brother, that we don't know how we're going to pay for some of them. And the pharmaceutical companies have not contributed to this to this latest proposal. Mm -hmm. So there's so much more we could say tonight. Um, I want to be respectful of your time and thank you again for being here. There are many, many questions we have not answered, but we will answer them on our website. And I think you know that that's uh, up on the screen. SaveArizonaHealthCare.org. We will continue to care for our community. We will continue to take care of everyone who walks into our emergency department. But over time, the costs will shift, and they will shift to all of us in order to keep our health care system alive. So thank you for your passion by being here tonight, and continue to help us.